Uh, we have a lot to get through in a short amount of time. And, uh, and, and I, so I want to jump straight in, all right? So uh, we, we are in the last message of our sermon series that we've titled hashtag more. Uh, we've said that we believe that God is calling us to more, uh, to more of his presence, more of his power and more of his promises, where in our personal lives, in our communal lives, and then in our missional lives. And that's what we've literally done. We've just kind of unpacked those and then asked God to do more, to do immeasurably and exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or think. And so this is the last one where we're asking God to do more in our missional lives, that God has called us to be on mission. That the Great Commission is a commandment, it's not a suggestion. That, that God, in His infinite grace, invites us to be a part of this incredible mission. And here's how we've said it here at Rooted Fellowship. We, we want God to add one more. Yeah. Just one more. So, so that we don't feel overwhelmed. I know many of us, we go, oh, the city of Pretoria, Gauteng, South Africa. It's a, you're just like, I'm so overwhelmed. So we go, okay, God, would you just add one more? Yeah. Yeah. And then add another one and another one and another, just, just start with one more Lord yeah. and so what we're going to see in our text this morning if you have a Bible you can meet me in Acts chapter 16 that's where we're going to be you're going to see Paul and, and a few of his friends literally with, with that heart that's just going one more one more God one more would you save one more and my hope is that that would become our prayer and so Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 comes bef before Acts chapter 15. And what happens in Acts chapter 15, or before, is it before? Yo, guys, I really did pass my trick. I really, I really did. It's Acts chapter 15 and then Acts chapter 16. What happens in Acts chapter 15? Everyone, everyone okay? Fantastic. In Acts chapter 15, uh, the, the, the church is radically shaken. And they are radically shaken because they, they, they are realizing that, that Gentiles are now coming to faith. Non-Jewish folks are, are now surrendering their lives to, 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 to God and saying, no, we worship the, the one true God. They, they, now they're going, what are we supposed to do with this? I thought this was just for us. I thought Jesus was just for us. And, and now Gentiles, non-Jewish folks are, are coming to faith. And so they say, you know what, let's, let's, uh, let's get together and have a meeting, right? And let's talk about this. Is, is this okay? Is this allowed? Here's the thing. If they had been reading the scriptures, they would have seen right from the very beginning that God has always been forming a family for himself from all people. There was no need for a meeting, but rather celebration. But, but they go, oh, let's meet, let's talk about this. Is this allowed? Is this okay? And Paul is there, and, uh, and he's probably going, you know what? God, one more. I've got to be sitting in this. What? Okay, fine. Yes, guys, yeah, let's look in the scriptures. Yes, God has always been about reaching the nations. Okay, and then they go, okay, cool. You can do it. You can now go to the Gentiles and, and share the good news of the gospel. And I'm sure Paul's going, well, even if he had said no, I would have gone anyways. I don't care. But anyway, that's, that's what happens in Acts 15. And so in Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and a group of guys going, okay, we're going. We're going for our one more. See, after experiencing a vision of a man of Macedonia pleading uh, Paul to, to come and, 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 and immediately come and, and come and help me here, after that vision, they get up and they make their way to Philippi, modern-day Greece. See, God was leading them to Europe. They find themselves in a city called Philippi. Acts chapter 16, verse 13 reads as follows. On the Sabbath day, we, this is Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, who's the author of this book, of the book of Acts, right? So, so the four of them, they went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now, they went to a river instead of a synagogue because guess what? There was no synagogue in Philippi. Yeah. According to Jewish tradition, there had to be a quorum of at least 10 male heads of household before a synagogue could be formed. So there wasn't even that. 
And so if these requirements could not be met, the, the faithful who were there in that area were, were to meet under the open sky near a river or a sea. This was, this was tradition, this was custom, this was law. And, and can I say this? Because they, they find a group of women praying there. So can, so can, I, can I say this? That, that, that we, we need to do better of our telling of church history with regards to the countless faithful women who have been praying, who have been praying, praying for not just the advancing of the church, but, but for the flourishing of the church. Even in this church, there is a group of women who, who said, listen, we, we want to dedicate our time, we want to gather and dedicate our time to praying, praying for this church, praying for people by name, praying for people by circumstances, and I am so thankful for these women. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Tyatira, was listening. Now, now some of you may be familiar with Lydia. She is no ordinary woman. Lydia was a woman from Tyatira, modern-day Western Turkey. The, the, the town was known for, among many other commercial ventures, it was known for its trade in expensive purple cloth. See, emperors and Roman senators, as well as the wealthy, would wear purple clothes as a, as a, as a status symbol, as a, as a sign of wealth, as a sign of importance. Everybody wanted to get their hands on the purple cloth. Lydia had moved from Tatira to Philippi to do business there. She, she was a woman who had connections. She had a thriving, successful business. She had wealth. And we'll see in a moment, she had a big enough house to not only host a few people, but to host a house church. Friends, Lydia was a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. She was listening to Paul. The text tells us that, that Lydia was a God-fearing woman. Remember, Lydia is with a, a group of other women on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. That even though with her little, little knowledge of who God was, it was evident that, that Lydia's heart was set on worshipping this God. That instead of doing business on the Sabbath, continuing to make money, no, 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 she goes, I'm going to close up shop and I'm going to go pray with some other women. That instead of the hustle, I'm going to spend time on the Sabbath praying to God. And then we find Paul unpacking the gospel. He, he's, he's filling in the gaps. He's now making it plain to Lydia and this group of women. Look what happens in the text. It says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. The Lord opened. This, to me, is both frustrating and liberating. Frustrating in that no matter how much I beg and plead with you, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and I do it every Sunday, I go, guys, you've got, you've got to surrender your life to Jesus. That, that no matter how, how much I do that, I possess no power yeah. to save. Yeah. Yeah. And neither do you. Now, this doesn't excuse us from sharing the gospel yeah. because that's what maybe we, 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 we might do. We might go, okay, I hear you on it. I possess no power to save, so then why, why bother sharing the gospel? Well, I'll give you two quick reasons why we share the gospel, even in this reality. Number one, because it's a command. Friends, I wish I had more for you, but, but because God tells us to. My hope is that we would be a people who go, you know what? We're going to do whatever he says. Yeah, amen. E even if it makes me feel a certain way, like we're going we're gonna to do whatever he says. And I say to you guys often, like I'm all for feelings, but they are horrible saviors. Yeah. They'll help us navigate through some stuff, but they will not save you. 
We share the gospel because God commands us to, and we want to be obedient to whatever he commands us to. Second reason we share the gospel is because we will share whatever captivates our heart. We just will. We, we will share whatever captivates our heart. Like, how do you know someone thinks uh, uh, climate change is important? <laughs> sorry? sorry? Tell you. They'll, they'll, they'll tell you. Yeah. How do you know someone is a, uh, I, I hear now it's not vegan, it's plant-based. How do you know someone is plant-based? How, 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 do you know, how do you know that Batman is the best comic book superhero? Other than the fact that it's true, how, how else will you know? Crossfit. Now, how do you know someone does CrossFit? That's a, that's a CrossFit people, we're praying for them. You will share whatever captivates your heart. And so it begs the question, if you're not sharing the gospel, and yet you say, I am passionate about Jesus, Guys, I'm not saying that your family is not important. I'm not saying your kids are not important. I'm not saying your career is not important. But it pales in comparison to who and what Jesus has done. This is why we share. So it's, it's frustrating in that, in that I, I can't save you, that you can't save anyone. And, and, and I get it. I get the frustration because, because when you think about the gospel, you think about your loved ones. You think about your friends and your neighbors. And you're like, if only they would bend the knee. Yeah but I don't possess the power to do so. So it's frustrating, but hear me, friends, it's also liberating. The Lord opened. It's, it's, it's liberating. See, I cannot save anyone because I am imperfect. I am a sinful human being. I need saving. A drowning person cannot save another drowning person. You, you just can't. And our sin, our sin is worse than drowning, friends. All of us are in desperate need of a savior. So before, before the Lord opens, here's the reality. Before the Lord opens hearts, we are enemies of God, destined to an eternal desolate place with no hope. That's all of us. But God. Amen. If you're looking for two really good words that are put together, but God. Amen. But God, rich in mercy, initiates a rescue plan. It's his loving kindness that leads us to repentance. And the story of Lydia, like many others, reveals to us the sovereignty of God in salvation. It shows why all the glory of our salvation rightly belongs to God alone, because he's the only one that can save. See, without God opening our hearts, we would never turn to Christ for salvation. So some of us act like it was our idea to do this whole church thing and be on mission and no left to our own we would always choose ourselves yeah. and so God steps in and reaches out see in the case of Lydia ha having this new heart enabled her to understand the gospel and to receive Jesus in her life for even though she ha had been worshipping God faithfully with other women she was a religious God-fearing woman. And that alone could not save her from sin. She still needed to personally put her trust in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Friends, we live in a country that, that assumes that we're a Christian nation. And that means that there are tons of religious people who go to church on a Sunday, who show up to a midweek gathering, read their Bibles, and all of these things are great things, important things, necessary things. But unless you put your trust and faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, those things mean nothing. You have to personally surrender your life to him, to, to, to let him in. He is knocking at the door. Yeah. Just let him in. Just surrender. Just, just, you know what it is? It's going, I need a favor, God. I'm drowning in the water. I can't save myself. No one here can save me. I need you. Yeah. And it's the one prayer that I know with 100% certainty he will answer. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says this, and I will give you a new heart and I will yeah. put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart 
and give you a tender, responsive heart. And so again, I ask, with all of this, the sovereignty of God in our salvation, then then I ask again, why do I need to share Jesus if we don't possess the power? If I and you don't possess the power, you might sit here and still be going, ah, but why? I'm thinking about my colleague. I'm thinking about my neighbor. I'm thinking about my family member, but why? Like, uh, and then what happens? Well, Well, here's why. Let me give you one more reason to why. Why we can't just sit back and relax. Romans chapter 10 from verse 13, it says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you calling today? You will be saved. Today. If you call on the name of the Lord today, you, you will be saved. Paul then goes on to write, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how, and how will anyone go and tell without being sent? Do, do you see it here? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Friends, I want us to be messengers who bring good news. Who bring good news. This is why. In God's infinite wisdom, he, 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 he has allowed us to participate on this mission. He, he rolls out the rescue plan that is not dependent on us, but it sure does involve us. Yeah. He, he invites us to be on mission, a mission that God is already on. Like, yeah. friends, when we talk about, I'm going to this place because they don't know about God. God's already there. Yeah. He's already there. Yeah. Working behind the scenes. Yeah. And going, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for you to, to obey. To take that, that step of faith, which in reality really feels like a risk. It does. Let's be honest. It feels like a risk. But on the other side of that, the reward of what God can and will do. And so... Even with all the success in the world that Lydia had and probably wanted, she needed something more. Something that could only be found in Jesus Christ, who comes to give life and life to the full. With all the success that she had, she still needed Jesus. And so she hears the gospel and, and, and opens up her heart and, and, and Jesus comes in and, and just incre- incredible. The Lord does an incredible thing. Another thing of importance to note here is that Lydia was the first convert to Europe. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. God gives Paul a, a vision of a man. Fast forward, it is a woman who is the first convert to Europe. Paul, who before surrendering his life to Jesus was, was a hardcore Pharisee. And as a Pharisee would have, would have prayed the, the Pharisaical prejudicial words, God, I thank you that I am not a Gentile or a slave or a woman. The text doesn't say this, and so, so please, but, but I believe that God gives Paul a, a vision of a, of a man because if he had given him a vision of a woman, I think he would have gone, uh, I don't know if that one is from God. But then God turns things upside down, which he loves doing. If you've ever felt like, I came to Christ and I feel like my life just turned upside down, well, that's what he does. Get comfortable with it. God flips things and saves a woman first as the gospel is unleashed to Europe. Charles Spurgeon says this on this matter. He says, man and woman fell together. Together they must rise. After the resurrection, it was a woman who was the first commissioned to carry the glad tidings of the risen Christ. And in Europe, where a woman was in future days to be set free from many of the trammels of the East, it seems fitting that a woman should be the first believer. He refers to her as a sort of first fruits for Europe. Women, you matter. You matter. 
You are part of God's plan. Beautifully woven in. Verse 15, after she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Be saved, get baptized, and then start obeying Jesus. Lydia opened up her home. See, from the gospel flows fellowship and feasting. It's right here. My hope is that we would persuade one another to fellowship and feast together. Philippi would become one of Paul's most cherished congregations. We see this in Philippians 1 verse 3. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. It all started with a woman. So Lydia comes to faith. Her household comes to faith. They don't stop there. They go, God, one more. One more. Acts 16, 16 says, once as we were... On our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. See, Paul and the gang are now on their way to a prayer meeting. They run into a slave girl, this modern-day human trafficking, who has been demon-possessed. The girl was filled with a demon who revealed the future to her clients. The text goes on to tell us she made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. Now, now you might be sitting here and going, are you saying that you believe in demonic activities? Yes. 100%. And here's why. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Friends, there are some dependencies, some depressions, some despairs, and some downturns that are just flat-out works of the demonic. Have you ever been with someone, or maybe you are that someone, who has an addiction to something, and even though you don't want it, you hate it, you want to be released from it, you simply, on your own, can't. I would call that the demonic. A spiritual stronghold. Now, we need to be careful here, because not every bad thing that happens in your life is a demonic attack. Sometimes bad things happen because of bad decisions. And if I was really getting comfortable in the living room of your heart. I'm talking about serious comfort. My feet are on the coffee table and my shoes are still on. Let's get comfortable. I would say that sometimes bad things happen because of dumb decisions. And we make them all the time. That debt is not demonic. It's because you are living beyond your means. That relationship, it's not demonic. It's because you neglect wise counsel and you keep sleeping with that person who is not your spouse. You are not cursed with loneliness. You just have a really bad attitude. Nobody wants to be around you. So we need to be careful. But this girl here, she had a a strong spiritual stronghold. She was demon-possessed. And I can say this, that if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, I don't believe that you can be demon-possessed because you're already possessed by the Spirit of God. You're already possessed by the Spirit of God. 1 John 4 verse 4 says this, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Romans 8, verse 9 to 11 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then you, he who raised Christ from the dead, will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the Spirit who lives in you. Let me keep going. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If you're a Christian, you are possessed by God. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Here's my favorite. I love this one. Ephesians 1.13. In him, you also were sealed. Sealed, sealed, sealed. And when you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, there's nothing else that's getting in there. Mm. Amen. Amen. 
As, as a child of God, you cannot be possessed by anything other than God. However, you can be tempted and lured to a life of sin. Yeah. Romans 7 speaks of this. Paul talks about this. He goes, man, there's things that I want to do, but I don't do, and there's things I don't want to do, but I find myself doing, ah! And then according to Hebrews 12, we're told that there are snares and, and weights that seek to entangle and hinder us from running our race for Jesus. You cannot be demon-possessed, but you sure can experience demonic attacks. And they are still much, uh, very much a reality for the children of God. Satan cannot snatch your life because that belongs to God. But he sure can keep you from living a, a life of joy and kingdom influence. Yeah. So beware, friends. However, this poor girl is demon-possessed. Verse 17, as she followed Paul and as she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Isn't it interesting that, that demons always see Jesus and his works for what they are? But it's the religious who completely miss him. I mean, we see it in Jesus' ministry, and we see it here. Why do you think that happens? I believe it's because the religious folks, they want to define Jesus for themselves. They want Jesus to fit in their nice and tidy little box. See, Jesus is not defined by us, mm. and he sits in no one's box. Yeah. Thank God. So many of us, we want to define God by our own imagination instead of defining God by revelation. Mm. It's already been said. Okay. And so the religious, they, they, they miss Jesus because they're like, no, 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 Jesus has to do this and has to fit this way and has to do this. And, but the demonic are just going, yo, oh, here comes Jesus. I often hear the phrase, friends, Christianity is under attack. And, and while I get what that means, I actually believe what many of us are actually saying is that my comforts are under attack. My comforts are under attack. Friends, if the government said that we can't pray, do we stop praying? If the, if the government says, stop sharing the good news of Jesus, do we stop? It's our comforts that are under attack. Let's get back to the story. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. She was delivered. See, Lydia was saved from her success. This slave girl was liberated from her stronghold. And, and when her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, the text tells us, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. I'm ready to disturb a city. Amen. I believe God's calling us to disturb a city. They are Jews, and they are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. You see, whenever the preaching of the gospel touches the economic structures of the powers that be, yeah. opposition is bound to come. Yeah. Yeah. You expose people, and then what comes to the surface is the reality that their hearts are actually in their wallets, not anchored in the gospel. So I ask you this morning, where is your heart today? Be honest. Be honest, where's your heart today? If we pulled your bank statements, would they reveal hearts anchored in the gospel pointing to heaven? Sure. Or hearts gripped by money yeah. and the promises of this world? Yeah. Oh, I've got to keep moving. Verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against them and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas, what happened to Timothy and Luke, you may ask, they probably escaped because they were Gentiles. But, but Paul and Silas uh, could not because they, were, they had obvious Jewish appearances, all right? That's, that's what happened here. It's not like they just left them. Uh, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What? I mean, praying I get. Lord, please get me out of this situation. Quick, quick. <laughs> But singing. A friend of mine, Joby Martin, says this. He says, sometimes when you're in a difficult place, your solution 
just might be to worship through it. This is why singing is important. It's not just words on a screen, friends. Some of us are in a difficult situation and we just need to worship through it. Things are hard, but I, I need to keep my eyes on Jesus. It doesn't look good, but he is great. I feel like I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but the good shepherd, he is with me. So I will fear no evil. Enemies surround me on it, but he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. When you are in Christ, God will deliver you. He will rescue you. Now, he may not deliver you from the current circumstances, but hear me, he's going to deliver you from the circumstance that you need deliverance from. Oh, amen. 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 What they prayed and sang about here mattered. It mattered to their own hearts, and it mattered to the hearers. You never know who's listening. Our faith is both personal and public. It's both personal and public. Verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. Prayer answered. Let's get out of here. We're gone. At least that's, that's what the jailer thought. Verse 27, when the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. You see, he, he was ready to take his own life because that was what was awaiting him. Yeah. You see, back then, if a prisoner escaped under your watch, the penalty was death because you failed. Because you failed. This man considered himself a failure. And if, by definition, a failure, he believed he had no reason to live. Friends, this is what happens when you define yourself by what you do. When what you do becomes who you are. I mean, it's, it's all good. It's all good to define yourself by what you do. Because I know in here there are highly competent people. Highly educated. Accolades upon accolades. Titles upon titles. It's all good. But as children of God, we don't define ourselves by what we have done. We define ourselves by what he has done. Amen. I am a child of God, and everything flows from that. Yeah. Amen. My, my, my husbandry. I don't know if that's an English word, but I'm going to use it. My husbandry flows from the fact that I'm a child of God. My fathery flows from, from the fact that I am a, a child of God. The mere fact that I'm your pastor flows from the fact that I am first a child of God. Because I fail in those things many, many times. And those things can be taken from me. But you know what can never be removed from me? The fact that I am a child of God. Verse 28, but Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we are all here. Someone needs to hear that today. Maybe you've come to the end of your rope, the end of your marriage, the end of your employment, relationships, emotionally, mentally, physically, you're just like, I can't do this anymore and I just want to end it all. Don't harm yourself. We are all here. Stop. We, we are all here. All of us, we are, we are here. This, this is why God beautifully, beautifully places us in community. You are not on your own. And I know, the, the, guys, the, Satan is a liar and he's whispering in our ears, oh, you're on your own, no one loves you. Just end it all, end it all. You failed, I can't believe you failed. Stop. We are all here. Verse 29, the jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, he had heard the testimony of the demon-possessed girl who had been set free. That's why they were in prison. He knew about it. 
And then he had heard their prayers and their songs in the night. And so now he, he, he witnesses this and he thinks, no, these guys are, are gone. But they're going, no, these, these, it seems like these men are concerned about me. His question was honest and vulnerable, and he received an answer that continues to be the answer even today. What must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Yeah. It's that simple. Amen. I believe the human heart is crying out. It's crying out. What must I do to be saved? Yeah. They, they, it may not be, be able to articulate it, right? Your neighbor may not be able to articulate it this way, but they're crying out. Those things that they're running to, hoping to find life and meaning and satisfaction, the heart is crying out. The heart was designed to worship God. Yeah. Crying out. What must I do? Must, must I do? Must I, must I drink more? Must I, is, it, is it more sex? Is it, is it more work? Is it more accolades? Is it more, what must I do? Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. One more. Paul and them are just going, one more. They, they stayed and they're like, you know what? We could go, but we've been praying and singing. These guys know the circumstances. They know what's going on. They know we loved God. One more. Even in this prison cell, give us one more. Some believe that the jailer's household believed simply because he did. But that's not true. The text tells us why they got saved. Paul came and spoke the word of the Lord to him and then to all who were in his house. Verse 32 tells us. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He's, he's just going, hey, look. You, you know that thing when you come to, come, come to Christ and you're just like, I just want people, I just, I just want other people to hear about this. How, how did I miss this my whole life? I just want other people to hear about it. They were all saved because they trusted the word of God and Jesus was revealed to them through the word. Verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds. Guys, the gospel heals. Amen. Not just physically. But it heals spiritually as well. You see, at the cross, the oppressed and the oppressor become family. In a country like this, I'm going, where's the church? Because we know this. We believe it to be true. But maybe we've stopped crying out for our one more. Maybe we've got our ticket to heaven and we're like, ah, no, next shop, I'm good. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house. Uh-oh. Set a meal before them. They tabled together. They fellowshiped and feasted together and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Lydia was saved from success. The slave girl was saved from strongholds. The jailer was saved from self. Himself. See, friends, Paul has the attitude of one more. One more, Lord. One more. One more. One more. Just one more. One more. And so my question to us is who is your one more? We're going to start praying today. And for the, throughout the year, we're going to start praying for our one mores. We're going to start praying, intentionally praying for our one mores. And, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but but I, I, want to start, I want to start right now, right now. We've already done it. We've prayed for our family groups. I want to start right now moving some furniture around in our church so that we can make space for our one mores. We're going to do some, some things. Some things are new and some things we're bringing back. We're bringing back lechutlas. Now, some of you are like, what is that? I don't have time to get into it, but they're amazing. And you get to invite your one mores. We show up and we have robust conversations about things that are happening in our society. And then we talk about Jesus. Eat and Run is coming up in a couple of weeks where we get to fellowship and feast with one another. It's an opportunity for you, not just for community, but also to invite your one mores. We just prayed for family group leaders. But, but, but also part of that group were, were a few folks who are part of what we're calling expansion family groups. Here's the thing. God is, 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 is sending people. He's bringing people. God is working behind the scenes. And so for a long time, people have been coming from, from Joburg and, and Pretoria North and uh, driving 35 to 45 minutes. There are folks in this room that every Sunday drive 35 to 45 minutes to be here. 
And for the longest of time, we kept going, you know what, can you find a church closer? Why don't you try this one? Why don't you go there? And then I just went, hold on, hold on. Uh, Henry Blackaby says this, watch and see where God is working and join him in his work. And so I'm just going, okay, God, clearly you're doing something. Make us uncomfortable. We want to move some furniture. So we're expanding to Pretoria North. And we're doing that by starting family groups there and then praying that they would multiply. And, and Pretoria North is, is massive. I mean, these last couple of weeks, I've been, I've been talking to uh, uh, Wesley and, and Vanessa, who own a, a uh, printing store in that community. They love the community, sharing with me the complexities of it. And I'm just like, wow, there's so many one mores there. And then J- Joburg North. We're going to Joburg, people. <laughs> City of Joburg, here we come. Not for our namesake, but for the kingdom. People are already coming, and it's amazing. But here's the thing. I want you to have the ability to invite your neighbor, because your, your neighbor who doesn't love Jesus is not going to drive 45 minutes. Yeah. On a Sunday, never. Never. And so we start by going, you know what? Well, why don't you come to a midweek family group? We fellowship and feast together. And they show up, and, and, and people are talking and engaging and loving and showing hospitality, and then the Lord opens up. Youth ministry. God is clearly doing something in our community. And, and, and I'm going, okay, we need to be thinking about the youth. We need to be thinking about the primary school to high school. We, like, what are we? We meet at a school. I mean, it's not, like, it couldn't be more obvious what God is calling us to. And so we're going to have a holiday club. Show of hands, anyone who is excited to serve in a holiday club? Some people are unsure. Is it because you know that you're going to have to take leave? Yes. You're, we're going to ask you to take leave. Maybe God is going to ask you to take leave. But we'll leave it at that. There's a whole bunch of things that we're going to be doing this year because we're saying, God, you, one more. One more. They're, they're open seats right now. They're open seats. That open seat is for one more. Not so that we can brag about, oh, look at our church. and look at, No. So that one day when we stand before the throne, we'll look around and be like, hey, I remember you. That we'll hear stories of someone going, you know what, I was at work and man, my life was falling apart and strongholds and I was pursuing success and I, was just, I felt like a failure. And someone came and just said, hey man, I want to talk to you about Jesus. One more. And so I'm going to call the band up. We're going to close. But in our closing, I say this all the time, the gospel demands a response. And so we respond by singing, which we'll do in a moment, praying, which we're going to do, and then obeying. I want us to be obedient about this one more. And so here's what we're going to do. We've got cards. They look like this. There's some here, there's some in the prayer corner, and there's some at the back. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we did something similar with hashtag fruitfulness. But on this card, you're going to write the name of your one more. Could be your neighbor, family member, colleague, friend, someone that you walk past every day when you go to the store, you're going to write their name and, and, and one name on each card. And then you're going to take that and you're going to throw it in this baptism pool. That's what this is. Now some of you might think, oh, is it a, for feeding cattle? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> we baptize people in there. You're going to throw it in the baptism pool because here's what's going to happen. It's going to go from paper to prayer to pool. The baptism pool. And when you put that name in there, we're going to be praying. For the next couple of months, we're going to be praying. And, and my prayer is that that name that I threw in there, that, that, that name that I wrote on that card, would become an actual person in the pool. Amen. Friends, because God is able. And I'll go ahead and tell you, my, my brother's name is on there. There are folks in here, they're on there. I'm still praying. I'm still, you know yourself, I'm still praying. My prayer is that one day you will be in there and we'll celebrate together because of all that God has done. And so the band's going to play a little bit. And as you feel comfortable and led to make your way to the front, make your way to the back, just grab a pen, grab a card, and start writing names. And then after this gathering, I'm pretty sure some of you are going to have some messages to send, some phone calls to make some coffee dates to set up. Take that risk. One more, God. One more. 
One more. It's not about me. It's about you. One more. It's about your kingdom advancing, not mine. One more. And then watch God reconcile and restore and heal. He wants to. Here's how the story ends. Acts chapter 16, verse 35 it says, When daylight came and the chief priest sent the police to say, Release those men, unaware that these men were already liberated men. Your chains don't bound, like I'm liberated. The jailer reported these words to Paul. The magistrates have sent orders for you to be released. So come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they beat us in public without a trial. Although we are Roman citizens and threw us in jail. And now we're, they're going to send us away secretly? Certainly not. On the contrary, let them come themselves and escort us out. I think a couple of reasons here is because they, they wanted the public to see that, no, guys, we did nothing wrong. You can trust us. We, we're just coming into your homes to talk about Jesus and what he wants to do in and through you. Verse 38, the police reported these words to the magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to appease them and escorting them from the prison, they urged them to leave the town. After leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged brothers and sisters and departed. See, Lydia opened her house for kingdom work and expansion. This woman, who's the first fruits of Europe, opens up her home so that more people might be able to come. By the time Paul and Silas is released, the number of believers in Philippi had increased. If we count the household of Lydia and the household of the jailer, and don't forget the slave girl who'd been delivered from a demon possession, who knows who else? Exceedingly, abundantly, immeasurably more. Your family group is not just a, a group of people we have. No, no. God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, immeasurably more. Lydia's home became the very first place in Philippi where Christians met together regularly. Therefore, the very first house church to be planted in the whole of Europe. There are house churches sitting here. sitting here. Later, that congregation at Philippi grew large enough to have its own elders and deacons and became a flourishing church that was generous, giving to the work of the ministry so Paul would continue with his ministry of one more. So will you trust God with your one more? And then will you take that step of faith? And so Father God, we come now asking that you would do this thing in and through us. gospel has radically changed many of our lives. You have moved us from death to life, from being an orphan to now being a child who is seated at the table, who gets to fellowship and feast with you. And then we get to fellowship and feast with one another. But here's the thing, there is so much room at the table for our one mores. God, I believe greater things are yet to come. We are instruments in your hand. Make us faithful. Make us obedient. Would you cause in us a passion for your name? We're praying for one more. And one more. And one more. And one more. In Jesus' name we pray.